Power Query parameters. You might know them as variables or input or conditions, but whatever you call them, they allow the user to customize the execution of a program to meet their specific needs. Creating parameters in Power Query can be performed different ways. In this video, I want to show you a popular and easy way to create and use parameters. This happens to be the first way I was taught to use them. Then I'm going to show you a better way that will not only make utilizing parameters easier, but also speed up query execution time by several orders of magnitude. As a bonus, I'll show you how you can pull parameters from multiple locations without the need for creating multiple parameter queries. We'll begin with this blue table that has my data, and then this green table that I've set up as what will be my parameter table. Notice that I've set this table as a proper Excel table, and I've named it parameters. Also notice the headings, option, and selection. That will become important later. I'm going to bring the green table in as a query, but then store it as a connection-only query where it doesn't actually produce any output. Then I'll bring the blue table in as data to be processed based on the settings of the green table. So let's first bring in our query table. So I'll go to Data, From Table Range. The selection column holds all of the user's choices. Now since this column has a mixture of dates and words, I can't set a data type for it, so I'll have to leave it as the any data type. Now this table isn't actually going to produce output, it's going to be used to feed the user's selection to the next query. So I'm going to go to the lower part of Close and Load, and say Close and Load 2, and then tell it I want to create just a connection. Now we'll go to the blue table, the data, and bring that into Power Query. So again, from Table Range. There are a few columns in here that I don't need, so before I set my data types, I'll get rid of those columns. So I'll go to Choose Columns, and I don't need the invoice number, the state, or the cost. Now I'll click a column heading, perform a control A to select all the columns in the table, and then I'll go to transform and say detect data type. Now as with a lot of things in Excel and Power Query, it's easier to build something in a static format just to make sure things are working properly and then turn it into a dynamic format. Since we need to filter by a date range, a product, a region, and a supplier, we'll go ahead and just invoke a temporary static filter. So we'll go to date, date filter, between, and then we'll just pick a date range. So I'll do all dates occurring in 2023. Now we'll go to product and we'll pick just one product. It doesn't matter which one. Same thing for region. I'll pick one region and I'll pick one supplier. If we look at the M code for when we filtered by date, you can see that it's filtering each row, but only keeping the rows where the date is greater than or equal to this date and less than or equal to this date. Same thing for the next set of filtered steps. We can filter where product equals baseballs, region equals central, Etc. What we want to do is we want to replace, say, this static entry for baseballs and have it point to the parameters query and go get the selection for the product row. Now, to point to any location within this table, we have to point to the query name parameters, the column name selection, and then the row number. So in this case, golf balls is on the third row. Now, there is a catch. Power Query doesn't begin counting with one. So it's not rows one, two, three, four, five. Instead, Power Query begins counting at zero. So the rows in this case are zero, one, two, three, four. So be mindful of that when you're referencing a specific row number. So we want the parameters table, selection column, second row. So going back to the sales info, I'm gonna remove the statically declared baseballs and instead tell it to go to parameters and then in square brackets, the name of the column selection, and then in curly braces, the row number. And remember, 0, 1, 2, so the second row. If I hit check, we're now filtering for golf balls. We originally had baseball statically defined, but the parameters table is now telling us to use what the user selected, which was golf balls. Now let's do the same thing for the region. The user selected northwest. We had statically declared central. Let's expand the M code. Now because I don't want to type this all over again, I'm going to highlight the dynamic entry for product, copy that, then I'll replace the statically defined central, and all I had to do is change it from row two to row three. Let's do the same thing while we're here for supplier. We'll replace the statically declared athlete's dream, and instead of pointing to row two, we'll point to row four. Hit check, and now you can see golf balls, northwest, sportsman's den, just like the parameters table has it set up. Now that works for these text-based entries, but what about these dates? If I go back to filtered rows, which was the step that filtered for a specific date range, if I try that same trick by replacing the static entry of a date equal to X, and I replace that with a pointer to the parameters table selection column, but I'll start with the zero row and then go all the way through the first row. When I hit check, we get an error. Because if you look back at the parameters table, this column, which is set up as any, doesn't understand that those first two entries are dates. 
So when we try to feed those into the date filter, there's a data type mismatch. So what we need to do is convert the entry in the parameters table into a date. So to do that, we're gonna need to wrap this parameters pointer in a date.from function. And I'll have to do the same thing for the end range parameter. Now when we hit check, the filter works. Let's go to home and load this out into an actual table. And now we have our filtered output. Let's change the parameters. We'll do January 1st, 2023 through December 31st, 2023. We'll switch to basketballs, central, specialty sports. Right click the output, refresh. Now, although this works, one of the problems of bringing the parameter table in the way we did is that the specific categories have to stay on the exact same rows. If product and region were to switch their positions, the query would break because the query is going to those very exact row numbers to pull those bits of data. Let's look at a way to bring the query in so that we don't have to worry about the row positions. This is gonna make the query more robust and a lot easier to build. So starting from the beginning, we have no queries. Let's go to our parameter table and go to data from table range. We'll bring in the parameter table. If you have a change type step, go ahead and delete that step. What we're going to do is we're going to go up to transform and we're gonna transpose this table. So instead of having an option column and a selection column, and then the actual options are hard coded to those rows, we're gonna transpose this. Now the options are in columns instead of rows. We'll use the first row as a header and set our data types. This is gonna give us two major advantages. One is we don't have to worry about the whole which row is an entry on because everything is on row zero. And so now instead of saying go to parameters selection two for the product, we can say go to parameters product and the number will always be zero. So the only thing we now have to think about is just the name of the field. And so we can say things like product, region, supplier, and everything is just row zero. So we'll go ahead and set this up as a connection only query. Now we'll bring in the data. And like before, I'll remove the columns I don't want, set the data types, and now I'll do my static filtering. I'll go to date between, I'll set up a static filter, January 1st, 2023, December 31st, 2023. We can see in the formula bar that the start and end dates have been hard coded. Back in parameters, we wanna replace those hard coded values with the entry from start date and end date, both of which are on row zero. So I'll select the first hard coded value, change that to parameters, then in square bracket, start date and then because everything's on row zero i just put zero in the curly braces now let's do the same thing for the hard-coded end date so this will also point to parameters square brackets end date and then curly braces zero it's always zero let's hit check and now we filtered for all 2023 entries i'll rename this step to filter dates now let's create a static entry for product so we'll filter for baseballs just statically then we'll go into the m code and replace the static entry with parameters, bracket, product, and then curly brace, zero. And now we've filtered for basketballs. We'll do the same thing for region, filter by a region, replace the hard-coded selection, and then finally the same thing for suppliers. Pick one selection statically, and now replace it dynamically. Let's rename these so we can keep better track of them. So filtered product, filtered region, filtered supplier. And just for a final touch in the output, I'll sort the results in ascending order by date. Let's go home, load this out to a table. I'm gonna put the results right here. So I'll change my arguments. Right click the table, refresh, and I have a whole new table. Let's go back into the query. So looking back at the M code, we can see for date, we filter by the start date and the end date. For product, we filter by product, region, by region, supplier, by supplier. The code is a lot easier to read. We did not have to convert the start and end dates using the date.from function, because if we look back at the parameters query, those data types have already been set. So Power Query understands them as dates, they don't have to be converted. Now, aside from easier to understand M code and easier to write dynamic queries, because everything's on row zero and we can reference everything by name. Something that I didn't clue you in on when we were using the previous version, when we had to actually go in to the dates and convert them using the date.from function, is that that conversion slows the query down tremendously. 
Looking back at the earlier version, where we had to use the date dot from function to convert what was on row zero into a date, or convert what was on row one into a date, that conversion process is slowing us down. Likewise, if you point to a row that has text, you may find situations where you have to use the text dot from function to convert whatever's in that cell to text. And if that were a number, you'd have to use the number dot from function to convert that back into a number. The data set I'm working with has 10,000 rows in it. Refreshing this query takes over a minute because of all of that conversion that has to take place. Converting text to dates or text to numbers, or in some cases, text to text. This is all slowing things down. By having the parameters table where each parameter is in a separate column, I can actually assign the data types now. They're not all combined in a single column that has to be data types generically. Since they have native data types, when I pull them in as dynamic parameters, I can just reference them. So dates go to date, text goes to text. Numbers would also go to numbers. Because there's no conversion taking place, this query when executed took two seconds. If I were to change the parameters, right click refresh, two seconds. So we went from over a minute to refresh because of all the conversions to two seconds. So the two main benefits of having your parameters stored on a row as opposed to a column are ease of implementation and speed because of the lack of data type conversions. Now here's a bonus trick for creating parameter tables. What if you don't want all of your users' choices to be in a single table? What if you want to spread the choices across the form? So I might want to have the products drop down here above product, but then skip the state column and have region here and supplier here. Same thing for my dates. I want to put them in a different location. I go to the table, right-click refresh, and I've got my new output. Now, if this was all the data you had, you would have to bring this date range in as a parameter query. You'd have to bring product in as a second parameter query, and then region and supplier in as a third parameter query. Now, to keep from having to create multiple parameter queries, what I've done, if I scroll over, is I have the parameter table over here the way I had designed it originally as a single table. This way, I only have to bring in one parameter table and then do the transposition and data typing, turning it into columns instead of rows. But what I'm doing is I'm linking each of these cells to these respective cells. So let me zoom out a little bit. So this cell D3 is feeding the first row of the table. D4 is feeding the second row of the table. C7 is feeding the third row of the table. E7 is feeding the fourth row. And F7 is feeding the fifth row. So the user makes their choices in one location and those get fed to a centralized table, which is then brought in as the parameters table for Power Query. So it is this green table that's feeding parameters, not the cells that the user is actually making their choices. This green table could be hidden, placed on a different sheet, that sheet could be hidden, and this will give you the freedom to design this user interface any way you wish. Thanks for watching, and remember, at BCTI, the learning never stops.